Well, integrated care is a kind of end, end product, if you like, for patients. It means that care is integrated across a pathway of care, so that care is not fragmented. Um, there are a number of ways of achieving integrated care. One is to have, um, or at least work towards an integrated organisation, where individuals, clinicians, work in the same organisation which is governed by the same governance arrangements and so on. Another is to have integrative processes whereby networks of clinicians don't work in the same organisation but actually work more closely together, knitted together by certain bits of glue. And the glue is could be shared governance, it could be shared budgets, it could be shared information systems, shared mission, um, and shared incentives actually aligned to achieve the ultimate goal which is integrated, coordinated, unfragmented care for patients. And there are various sorts of integration um, that people are talking about. The classic ones are whether integration is hor horizontal, that is between similar types of provider organisations, or indeed um, or vertical integration, which is where integration can occur between different types of provider organisations, for example, between hospitals and primary care or hospitals and community care. Well, I think at the moment the main goals for integrated care would be to offer a better patient experience and better patient outcomes, which hopefully would lead to less avoidable cost of hospital care. Clearly the financial climate is, is dire and clearly the NHS has to make significant efficiency savings and clearly the NHS has got a long way to go to improve outcomes of care for patients. So I think integrated care is being talked about in order to try to reduce avoidable care, avoidable costs of care, in particular avoidable emergency admissions and in particular avoidable emergency admissions for people with chronic long-standing care. That's I think the ultimate goal. The big question is whether or not integrated care can achieve those savings and if it can, and outcomes, and if it can, over what time period. And I think there are big questions about whether it can achieve those sorts of things within a short time frame, which is what's required now. Uh, because we know that integrated care takes time to develop. If you look at the most successful organisations uh, who do this, for example in the USA, they've taken 20, 30, 40 years to develop. Um, so I think we should be pretty humble about what we can achieve uh, quickly. I think the quickest wins will be to look at, um, in the area of emergency admissions, in particular, we know that over the last five years, emergency admissions have risen by 11%. Of that, about 7% cannot be accounted for by demographic change. And if you look at the rise in emergency admissions, most of that 7% is due to zero length of stay admissions and one day length of stay admissions. Uh, which seems to be aggravated but not caused by targets, by payment by results, um, and, uh, and so on. So I think that's the area where I think quickest wins could be gained. Well, one of the main reasons, I think, why the uh, emergency admissions are rising, for example, is because there is this Berlin Wall between primary and secondary care, and to, a less, to, a, to the similar extent, actually, between hospital and social care. Uh, and uh, I remember from my days as a, a physician in casualty um, being faced with patients that where there was a huge discretion about whether or not those patients needed to be admitted. But I usually admitted them if there were beds available. Um, if I knew a lot more about primary care services, if I had access to a, a, a GP, if I had access to social care, for example, if I knew a lot more about what happened in primary care and I had more confidence in it, then I would have probably um, not admitted a lot of those patients. So I think the biggest barriers towards integrated care are the barrier, historical barriers between primary and secondary care and between hospitals, in particular the health service and social care. Those need to be overcome. Um, how can they best be overcome? Well, there are various, going back to what I was saying earlier about the difference between integration, integrated organisations and integrated care, there are certain things that can be done to help coordinate, to help link clinicians working together in primary care and hospital care and, and other settings. And that includes co-location. It it, that means having offices where they can see each other and talk to one another. It means electronic communication between them, email, phone contacts. How often does that happen? It means better information, forensic patient level information 
on activity use costs of the patient care along the pathway so they can talk about it. It means clinical leadership across the pathway so that clinician leaders can scrutinize the um, information and activity of patients and scrutinize when things go wrong. An emergency admission in many respects should be considered a failure of ambulatory care. And so I think weekly analysis, um, it means shared aligned incentives within the network to try to um, reverse thrust all the admissions that are going into hospital and provide far greater incentives and investment outside of uh, hospitals um, and so on. Those are the kind of integrative processes that are needed to overcome some of these barriers and probably ultimately there needs to be um, a reduction or at least a, 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 a complete removal of this barrier that's artificial that's been there since 48 between primary and hospital care. Um, whereby there should be probably ultimately joint contracts that are similar between the GP contract and the consultant contract, um, joint capitated budget envelope, shared financial risk, shared decision making, shared information flows. Uh, only if we can overcome that barrier can we really make some great gains in health and efficiency in the health service. Yes, I mean, there have been several studies of really high-performing integrated care organisations, most of which are in the United States, but there are some outside in Europe, in Holland, for example. Um, and we, when I was at the King's Fund, we conducted a study looking at five of the most successful integrated care organisations. The Commonwealth Fund has recently produced analysis of the ingredients for 15 of the top integrated care organisations, such as Kaiser, Intermountain, um, Geisinger, Group Health, the Mayo Clinic, and so on. And the ingredients really come down to four things. Um, one is that inside these organisations, inside these organisations, there is um, detailed information. On, on patients, forensic information at patient level on outcomes, cost and use. And secondly is that there is clinical leadership and there are clinical leaders who take responsibility for peer reviewing their colleagues for performance along these pathways to scrutinise avoidable cost, avoidable ill health. Thirdly, the financial incentives are highly aligned so that everyone is really rowing in the same direction to try to keep the patients as healthy as possible. And this results in eye-watering uh, efforts, daily efforts, to try to keep people healthy and support them and so on. And the fourth thing is that there is clinical sharing of governance of the organisation, almost physician co-ownership of the organisation, whereby uh, at base the organisation is a clinical organisation, it isn't a managerial one and there, that it, where there are managers, doctors and managers work together and they're joined at the hip and they don't recognise the kind of tribal division that we kind of recognise. I suppose there are two other factors that also seem to come up. One is time. These organisations take a long time to develop, um, sometimes decades. We don't have decades, so we have to act faster. And the other one, which is very important for us, is that um, integrated care organisations have a very strong sense of mission and they attract and select in doctors who share that vision and staff. And they also are able to select out um, people who do not operationalise that mission. And so there is quite a lot of movement. So how much of the virtuousness of these organisations is caused and the good, excellent care is caused and as a result of selection is unknown uh, over and above all these other factors. But it's a clear factor and clearly in this country we have less capacity to do that. The big, the big issue at the moment seems to be is that, that a lot of people think that if you integrate care between say primary and care, secondary care, then that just sets up cosy monopolies uh, and the whole thing will turn to mush. Um, in fact, um, it is possible to have um, integration to coexist with competition and essentially, I mean, if you look at an uh, organisation like Kaiser, you have an integrated organisation that is highly competitive uh, in Southern California, Northern California, wherever a Kaiser t tends to be. So it is entirely possible that these networks can compete for patients or indeed for state contracts depending on how competition is set up. The, the, the other point to make about this issue about competition is that it is not clear 
the extent to which external competition as an external challenge on these organisations um, is, the, is a, an important factor in improving their excellence. Because in the US, it is certainly true that if you go to Kaiser, they will say that competition really does prompt them in a, in a daily fashion to try to improve their game. But if you go to a place like Geisinger, that is, uh, or into Mountain, that is uh, um, located in, in rural areas where there's practically a monopoly, they will say it is these intra-organisational factors, such as information, aligned incentives, clinical leadership and so on, that does the trick. So it's not quite clear and there needs, there is, there's been insufficient analysis. Nevertheless, we're in a kind of political environment where competition is something that's going to be tried. So I think the main message is that it's entirely possible for competition in a variety of forms to occur with, with um, integration. There are several things going on. Uh, the first thing is that the Department of Health has funded several pilots. At least 16 pilots are occurring to try to um, pilot various types of integration. And in fact, the Nuffield Trust is involved in evaluating the impact of those on service use and cost. Um, the second thing is outside of the Department of Health funded pilots, there are at least seven or eight quite highly radical sites that are wanting to do go further and faster. And some of those are doing it because of a local problem with the hospital. The hospital uh, can no longer be viable and therefore there's a kind of burning platform. So there are five or six areas in the country that we at Nuffield are working with um, who are doing some very exciting things, trying to go faster further than everybody else. And we are helping them through learning sets and so on. And that information is available on our website for those who are interested and need some moral support.